gave you guys a challenge uh, to think about these three passages of Scripture and answer my question in light of these biblical texts, how come all of you are not pacifists? I figured somebody might. I had a really dear friend of mine who teaches Old Testament at Denver, um, who is a thoroughgoing pacifist, as evangelical as you'll find. Um, and it was part, I think, partly based on his experience uh, teaching and on the mission field in Latin America that brought him to that. Okay, so here's whole. Do you have a cl clarifying question or you're jumping in? I like the one. Okay. So here's what, I, what I'd like to do is I'm going to give you about two or three minutes with the person next to you. Give them, give them either okay, your best reason that you're not a pacifist or tell them, but based on these passages, what is it that makes you a pacifist? Okay. So if, 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 you, if that's where you are, we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll talk about both of these. I think, I think bo both views have, like, like the death penalty issue, both views have hard questions that they have to answer. Okay. The just war proponent seems to me has some really hard questions about those passages of Scripture. Pacifist, I think, has some other hard questions that are not specifically related to those, but to some other parts of Scripture and some other theological notions. Okay, let's, let's make one thing clear I think, that, that I think we can all agree on, uh, and that is we, we touched on this with relationship to the death penalty, that the, the Sermon on the Mount is, was not addressed to the state, right? Sermon on the Mount is for, as, as Willard describes it, this, descri this, this section describing matters that relate to personal injury, not to, not to government, right? Now, granted, with the death penalty, I think that was, that was a, a more determinative claim. Here, with, with the morality of war, I don't think that doesn't really settle very much. Because the question for the believer is not whether or not the state is justified in waging war. The question for the believer is can he or, she, he or she participate with the state when it wages war? You know, or for that matter, can the believer participate with the state in other occupations that require the use of lethal force? Okay, so we all, so the so the pacifist could concede that the Sermon on the Mount is not addressed to the state and say, so what? We you still have a lot to deal with to justify a notion like a just war. All right? Okay? Now, let me see a... Oh, I'm going to take a show of hands. I'll do that. Um, well, let me hear, th those of you who hold to a just war idea, give me your best reason that you are not a pacifist. You did talk about this. I'm sorry? Defense. Defense. Okay, so there's an oblig... You, you would say you still have an obligation to self-defense and defending the vulnerable. Okay. But based on what? I, th I, thought, I thought the Sermon on the Mount says when somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn the other.
like your illustration in your book, someone comes in from the family and they're threatening them, I'm not going to stand there and say, go ahead and kill my family. Okay. I'm okay. Go and defend my family. On what basis? Okay, that's not good. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. That makes it that makes it understandable, mm -hmm. not justifiable. Okay, no, I, but I I get that. Okay, All right. I think the I think the don't the response to the slap is misread a little bit, because what Jesus is talking about is when you're slapped on the right cheek, when you're hit on the right cheek, and the way that that would occur right. would be that way. He's right. talking about strikes of humiliation in that which so be a, okay as opposed all right to, but, but so I think so that the flip side of that is is also that he says to love your enemies and i just don't understand how we love our enemies with bullets okay well, hold hold that thought for just a second uh because there's there's a really well publicized bumper sticker that says something to that effect that jesus said love your enemies don't shoot them <laughs> oh, okay okay Okay. Now, again, let's let let's. I want to be careful to distinguish between the application to the state and the application to the individual. Okay, because what we're dealing with here is the the morality of maybe we should re retitle this: the morality of the individual's participation in war or in the use of lethal force. All I did was clarify that. But I'm, I'm curious, kidding. where in Scripture does it say to use self-defense? Okay, that's another, hold, hold, again, hold that thought. Okay. All right. Because we're, we're, that's part of what we're coming to. Okay. All right. So, essentially, so, so far, the, the best reason that you're not a pacifist is what, that the Sermon on the Mount doesn't prohibit self-defense? Is that how you would put it? Okay. And I was going to say that um, at, this may be just jumping to the state level rather than the individual level, but I think that the state, the government, has an obligation based off of Romans 13 to govern the people. Okay, and all right. And also based off of the Old Testament text that say protect the, the, um, the vulnerable and the weak, that the government, the ruling authorities, have an obligation Okay. Rome, Romans 13 does suggest that the state does have the authority to use force. Okay. Now, again, but you can't conclude from that by itself that the, the individual believer is just of necessarily justified in using force just because the state is. There's an additional argument that has to be made to, to, make, to make that conclusion. Okay. So Okay, all right, so you would say there is, basically, the reason I'm not a pacifist is because there's nothing wrong with the believer participating with the state in its God-ordained responsibilities, right? Okay. The Matthew passage specifically is a one-on-one -on -one situation. None of the examples are life-threatening. And it is a dominant society over a subservient uh, okay. oh. person. So we have here not the same situation that that is a life-threatening situation. Okay. So, All right. And the other thing is. Okay. Hold on. I'm gonna, just going to summarize for you. I'm going <laughs> to just hold hold that thought. Okay. So the reason you're not a pacifist is because the Sermon on the Mount doesn't require it. Part A. Okay. Okay. Part B would be nowhere in the New Testament scripture do we see an admonition that counters God's claim that we should protect the lesser individual. And so there's no admonition there that says that self-protection and self-defense is wrong. Oh, okay, although... I'm saying no, throughout the Old Testament, there's no admonition that says it isn't okay 
and if it okay. was really wrong. Okay, although that's an, arg base, that's an argument from silence. Silence, indeed. Okay. Uh, although Jesus did get mad and overturn the money changers in the temple, he drove them out. He used violence to get them out twice. True. Again, but not. Again, structures, not people. He drove out individual people. He put, yeah, but, he, but it wasn't. Okay. All right. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Can tell. I, I, I'm getting a sense of where this is headed here. Okay. Now. Okay. Are there any any other arguments for you know why you're not a pacifist? Okay, that's another sort of, sort of relates by extended Isaac's point on that. That's, a, that's another way to put that. Okay. Okay. That, you, the, the, the pacifist, I think, has explaining to do on that. Okay. And that, I think that's, that's a diff, a, one of the difficult questions that they have to face. Okay, so, all right, uh, so. So I want to start there. Ask okay. Do I agree with uh, the administration and the Biden responses or want to add in that come to what that particular government uh, actually subscribes to in terms of. Okay, so you, you want to you leave open. I'm not, sure that, I'm not sure that's an argument for a principled pacifism, but at least you want to leave open the idea that. Um, well, that you, uh, oh, okay, yeah, but but that doesn't, yeah, but but the just be just because the state might be in might be fallible in its decision to go to war, does not obligate the just war proponent to all of those things that the state deems are just wars. Right. No, that's right. No, that's right. right. Now, this is, this is where it gets, I think, a little challenging for the believer who's in the military because you, you don't get that choice. I mean, you have, you, you, can't, you can't say that I'm not going to Iraq because I think that's an unjust war. Right? Now, you do, have, you do have the right to disobey what you consider to be an unjust or immoral order. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. That's right. No, of course we have to evaluate the justice of each of those. Remember, though, to, on the other side of that, that uh, Ro Romans 13 was written when Nero was the emperor. It was somewhat akin to a character like Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi. That's all. That's also true. It was la right, large, right, largely with soldiers who had converted. What happened to my? Um, lar largely with soldiers who had come to faith. Okay. Okay. No, I think my thing, just, my computer just went to sleep. Okay. Now, on the other side of this, those of you who are pacifists. What, what's, what's the most, why, why, are you a, why are you a pacifist? Is, is it just reading these texts, or is there something else that gives you your reason? concept that I have is that 
and it's kind of adopting one of the arguments against capital punishment is that you cannot um, you can't reform somebody if you take their life. You cannot. Mm -hmm. you, you can't. You know, and, and our obligation is to preach the gospel. That's what that's right. what Jesus. All right. Was to do is preach the gospel, not and so, you know, it's almost a more of a. I, I'm I'm not so much against the state, as I as I look at it in terms of personal involvement. What okay. what would right. I be required? Okay. To so let me let me make this a little more concrete. Yeah. Uh, you are. Because really, no. I am still. I'm going to I'm going to make this I'm going to make this easier for you. Okay. Okay. You you are an American soldier in World War II. Uh, and the bombing runs that you go on uh, the the soldiers that you shoot uh, personally uh, or kill with artillery fire. Uh, will m most likely have put you in a position of killing another brother in Christ. Now, you can't tell who those are, but the idea that you could be you know, looking down you know, your rifle scope at another brother in Christ and him doing the same to you See that that's part that's part of I think what is what is so unsettling about this idea that there can be even such a thing as a just war. Right? Now I suppose I suppose you could be a procedural pacifist also. While while it, you know while it, you could sort of you have the you know you go under the assumption that it's basically impossible to conduct an entirely just war, even though in principle you wouldn't be opposed to it. Uh, but, and, and it sort of recognizes that once you enlist, you don't you sort of you lose a lot of those choices. Um, but th there really aren't there just there aren't procedural pacifists out there for the most part, like there are procedural abolitionists with the death penalty. Most of the pacifists who give expression to this are they're not only principled, but they're absolutists about it. Now, I suppose one of the ways you could think about this is you could, you could concede everything the pacifist claims and do something akin to what Bonhoeffer did and admit that in those, in those rare cases where your, your personal self-defense or the safety of your loved ones was at stake, you were faced with a moral, a genuine moral dilemma between the obligation to love your neighbor. That's what I was fishing for with your response. It's the admonition to love your neighbor as yourself that grounds that. Um, and the mandate for nonviolence. And to admit that there are times when those will inevitably conflict. Granted, I think they are pretty rare. Uh, the person who takes this position probably could not join the military, but would not be opposed to using lethal force if it were the only way to protect yourself and or your loved ones. Okay, something like that. So framing it in terms of this moral conflict, si similar to Bonhoeffer, but without you know, without you know, holding that it's a lesser of two evils. 
seems to me to be one, one way to, 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 to frame this and to think about it. Um, now, what that, again, what that's conceded, that, in, in, for the just war person, that would concede far more than you'd be willing to concede. Right? Because you would be conceding that these passages really do teach pacifism. But that there, there would be times when you could weight the obligation to love your neighbor more heavily than the obligation to, to be nonviolent. Are you with me on that? that? Okay. Now, the, what, we, what I'd like to go back to is sort of whether or not it's necessary to concede that these passages teach Pacifism. Right? Now, Matthew, Matthew 5, I think, is the trickiest of the three that uh, we cited. Right? Now, you, I take it you guys are familiar with all this. Romans 12, the one in the middle, I think, is the least <coughs> difficult to deal with because in Romans 12, Paul is is specifically prohibiting what? Vengeance, Vengeance retaliation. retaliation. Okay? He's prohibiting retaliation. Okay? Now he does say, you know, uh, you con conquer evil by doing good. But that's specifically as opposed to furthering a cycle of reta retaliation, whereas as some people say in the Middle East today, if everyone took an eye for an eye, we'd all be blind eventually. Um, right? Not to say that the eye for an eye is necessarily problematic as a figure of speech, since that was designed, as you know, to limit retaliation, not to foster it. Right? So I think Romans 12, I think is, it's difficult to cite Romans 12 to support the principled pacifist. Right? Because Romans 12 is applicable no matter what you think about the use of lethal force. Romans 12 prohibits retaliation. Okay. Now, Matthew 5, it's not, not, that's not quite so, I, I don't think that's so clear that you can escape the import of Matthew 5 by simply arguing that Jesus is prohibiting retaliation. Okay. That, it seems to be you know, the eye for an eye you know, refers to retaliation, but Jesus is saying, you've heard it said, this about retaliation, but I'm saying to you something that's far broader and deeper and more complicated. All right? And the part, of, the part about 1 Peter 2 that I find particularly troubling for the just war proponent is that it grounds all of its teaching in the example of the cross. And last time I checked, the example of the cross was a mandatory part of the program. Right? Nobody, nobody has moral dilemmas around the centrality of the cross for, for what our lives are about, right? No, nobody, nobody gets to weight that, you know, less heavily than something else. That's, I mean, that's a trump card, it seems to me, okay? So th those of you who are not pacifists, how do you understand these these four examples here in this in this first segment under under that heading of eye for eye. Right? Now, one of the things this passage doesn't give you is oh well, it, yeah, it does in thirty in thirty nine. You've heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Now that sounds to me more like complete non-resistance to evil, not just 
nonviolence. Right? Because there are some, some pacifists who hold you can resist evil, you just can't use lethal force to do it. You know, like Martin Luther King was a nonviolent pacifist. But he was deeply resisting the evil of racial injustice. Right? So why, why wouldn't we say that really what Jesus is requiring here is the approach of someone like Gandhi, who almost, almost complete non-resistance to evil. Right? Why? So how, that's, I guess that's the first, you know, do not resist an evil person. which raises the question here, what about Hitler? And Brimlow concludes to sum up then the main difficulty in accepting the implications of our call to be peacemakers is our fear and death of death and dying, born of a weakness of faith. Well, there's, yeah, we know you could fill in a number of other names there. Okay? What, this, is a hard, this is a hard question. For those of you that hold the just war idea, I think this is pretty challenging seems to me. Now, here's, let me suggest one way to think about this. Okay. You remember, those of you that have had hermeneutics, you get a little shot of Bible study methods at the beginning, right? Okay, we'll see how well you remember this. This passage is an example of a certain type of structure that's really basic to you know, sort of outlining how biblical texts are, are put together. Okay? It's a move, you could say it's a, move, it's a movement from one thing to another. Okay? We get, this is an example of a movement from general to specific. Okay? Because here's the general statement, and then there are one, two, three, four specific examples that spell out what is meant by the general statement. Right? That's its purpose. Right? So the do not resist an evil person is qualified by the four specific examples that are given. Right? Now, let's think about each of those examples. You, Mark, you're right about the turn the other cheek. Okay. And it's, it's clear that that's not a, a, a mortal threat. It's an insult and a humiliation. Okay. Now here's the, the, the question this raises is the response that Jesus gives to turn the other cheek is in contrast to what kind of response would normally be expected? To strike back in retaliation. Okay. Now please, I mean, hear this correctly. This is, this is more than just good advice to a persecuted minority. Right? I mean, this is, pr this is part of a principled life of what life in the kingdom is like. So for one, I think the point of this first one is to turn the other cheek is a, these are, and these are all figures of speech, right? Because to, to slap on the right cheek is a, is not, it, it includes the literal, but isn't limited to it. Okay? So basically when the, the slap is a figure of speech for, you know, something that is insulting or humiliating. 
to you. Okay. And so the, the, the point of that first example is when insulted or humiliated, you remain vulnerable instead of retaliating. Now, I don't think Jesus literally intended for you to turn the other cheek, literally, okay. in contrast to what some Amish would hold. And I don't think that, I think, it's a, again, that's a figure of speech for non-retaliation, okay. that you do that instead of what was expected. Okay. Now, if someone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Now again, notice the, the response. If someone wants to sue you and take your shirt, okay, is Jesus literally saying that you also give him your coat? No. Maybe if that exact scenario arises, yes. But it's not limited to that. So what is, what is the giving of one's coat? That's actually why I wore this today. Uh, what is giving of one's coat a figure of speech for? Give them more than they ask for. Right? As opposed to what? As opposed, as opposed to fighting. Okay. Typically when somebody sues you, you countersue them, right? And it's a, you know, it's 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 a it's a legal. Um, I, yeah, it, well, it's a it's a legal sort of mutually assured destruction. Right? God help. That's correct. That's right. That's right. Okay. okay. That's right. Okay. So what that suggests is that somebody is suing you, and he's suing you for something that the law has prohibited as unjust. Right? The law prohibits, you know, suing someone to take their, you know, the basic things that they need to survive. Okay. So, again, the, the point is, again, I think a, a figure of speech that's being used for when, when sued, even when sued unjustly, okay, the figure of speech is give more than is asked for Would we say, is that required when you are sued? To offer, I mean, that'd be quite a legal strategy, wouldn't it? To offer more than you are sued for? No, I think it's a, it's a again, it's being used as a figure of speech, but to communicate what? The life of our disciple. That's exactly right, okay? Which is a life of non-retaliation to injustice, okay, and a life of seeking to live at peace and in goodwill with all you come in contact with. You must have read Dallas Willard's little segment on that, because that's exactly the point that he makes. In fact, he puts it, All is changed when we realize that these are illustrations of what a certain kind of person, the kingdom person, will characteristically do in such situations. They are not laws of righteous behavior for those personally imposed upon or injured, 
they're not laws for the obvious reason that they don't cover many cases. Additionally, if you read them as laws, you'll immediately see that we could obey them in the wrong spirit. For example, as is often actually said, I'll turn the other cheek, but then I'll knock your head off. <laughs> okay, here's, in every concrete situation, we have to ask ourselves, not, did I do the specific things in Jesus' illustrations, but am I being the kind of person Jesus' illustrations are illustrations of? Now, we could go on with this, but I think the, part of the point is that in none of these is there, I mean, these are, these are insults, humiliations, and inconveniences, not mortal threats. Okay? So, the, I think one of the answers you could give to the reason I'm not a pacifist is that Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, is not addressing mortal threats. So that you could still, I mean, I think you are obligated to take these kinds of responses. I think what he's primarily referring to is the non-retaliation. Where it seems to me that, that that's, for the believer, is off the table. Paul makes that so clear in Romans 12. I think Jesus is suggesting something a little broader than just non-retaliation. I don't want to leave that. Because that, has, that has the spirit of a law that I think Dallas is, is rightly trying to get away from. Um, but I think in, in general, uh, the, 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 I think the hard question for the pacifist about what to do when you are personally attacked with a mortal threat, I think is not a, it's just not addressed here. And it seems to me that that's, I think that's a problematic application. I guess it is, Dallas. Right, now the the part that the part of this whole conversation that I find the most difficult, and I am and I am a, a sort of a modified just war proponent, is in First Peter two. To this you were called, which is, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. It's 1 Peter 2, beginning in 21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. And the point of that is to show that he was innocent, not deserving of the, the punishment he received. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Okay, now notice that this, I think, is the heart of that. What the example of the cross means here is that when they hurled insults at him, he didn't do what? Retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Threats of what, generally? Threats of retaliation. Okay. Which his disciples actually asked him to do. Remember? Okay. You know, can't, can't you call down legions of angels, not only to get you off the cross, but to retaliate against your oppressors? And of course, Jesus was having none of that. Instead, Instead of retaliation, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Right? Now, I, I would not want to say that retaliation is necessarily inconsistent with self-defense. I do think Augustine's justification 
for what sort of opened the door for the idea of a just war was this idea of uh, the obligation we have to love our neighbor. And that, as Augustine put it, if I, you know, if I see my neighbor being assaulted uh, and I do nothing to stop it, can I really say that I've loved my neighbor? Uh, and I think for Augustine, if, if lethal force were necessary, to repel the assault, then so be it. And then he, and I think he saw, he saw the, the 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 law of loving your neighbor as yourself as the highest good in this regard. Now, anyway, that's what that's what opened the door to this. Now, I think it's also true that. There's nothing in principle that would prevent a believer from cooperating with the state as it fulfills its God-ordained obligations. And I think that the pacifist, I think, has a, has a little trickier road to navigate with that. Um, now, the part, of, the part that troubles me as a just war proponent is this idea of loving your enemies and pray for, praying for those who persecute you. That, 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 I think, is a really challenging part to this, particularly for my role as a combatant in war. Um, it's, it's not as clear, you know, um, again, we, to take Willard's point, we, we, we need to resist the temptation to take these, these components of the Sermon on the Mount and treat them as in a, in a, in a casuistry like, like you know, sort of abstract laws um, that, we, that we are absolutely obligated to adhere to. Um, I think it's, it's it's produ this, this is producing this kind of a person. So it's the per I think what Jesus is teaching here is that the, 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 the person, the, the, the person who, who is a follower of Jesus living in the kingdom is characterized by love for enemies. What he's, what's not being said See, it seems to me, is that you know, when, when your enemy is actually attempting to kill you or to kill your loved ones or to kill your neighbor, is there, is there another obligation uh, that, that where, where you would have loving your, your neighbor and loving your enemy that actually might come into conflict with each other. Right? Now, some would say you're not really loving your enemy if you allow him or her to assault someone uh, without the use of force to, to, to stop that. Um, it's a little tougher, I think, to make the point that, that loving your enemy is, is consistent with using lethal force. That, I think, is a little tricky. while still you know, doing your duty to fight against them. I think there's an attitude in your heart that can be an attitude in which you know, your, your mindset towards this person is not one of hate, but in terms of fighting for your country, you're going to do your duty. And if that means killing them, that means killing them. But I think your attitude can still be one of love. I mean, the, the, the verse does not say don't fight against your enemy. It says love your enemy. And I think that has to do with an attitude but, but when it comes to, I think that that passage might actually be more in terms of personal enemies, not so much, um, you know, state enemies. And in personal enemies, it's the same thing. You've got to have an attitude towards them, right. and that's got to be reflected in the way you treat them. Right. Here's, see, here's the, the, the other part of this that I think is really tricky for the pacifists. 
in light of this is that you know, neither Jesus nor John the Baptist nor the Apostle Paul required soldiers to give up their profession when they came to faith. We'll stop with this today. Probably the clearest place where this occurs is in the early chapters in Matthew where Jesus, where John the Baptist is preaching. You're right, it is in Luke. Yeah, it's in Luke. Thank you. Yes, in Luke 3, beginning in verse 7, um, where, you know, the, the, you know, the rich came, tax collectors came, and then, sold, then some soldiers asked him, and, and what should we do? If I don't extort money, don't accuse people falsely, and be content with pay. In other words, don't abuse your power to benefit yourself and to oppress the community. Uh, You know, Jesus had Roman centurions who came to him for healing and were converted. Uh, and I think I, so I think you can make a, you can make an argument actually that the Book of Acts depended on the Roman military to fulfill Acts one eight. To get the God, I actually think Acts one eight was fulfilled by the end of the Book of Acts, which makes it a nice climactic point. But remember, Paul's under house arrest in Rome, being guarded by four, by, by groups of four Roman soldiers on a four hour rotating basis, for which he had a captive audience for the gospel on a rotating basis, and it's clear that for, from our we know about the Roman legion, that they went out particularly to guard the farthest reaches of the Roman Empire from incursion. And so what you had, in essence, at the end of the book of Acts was a missionary sending station that came out of Paul's two-year imprisonment. Right? Now, I realize that's, you know, you, you can dispute the argument of the book of Acts on that. If that's, if that's the case, then I think that would, that would strengthen the idea that there was nothing intrinsically incompatible with following Christ and military service. And even uh, somebody as, as I say, non-evangelical as Richard Hayes from Duke Divinity School in his Moral Vision of the New Testament essentially makes the argument that uh, the Gospels opening the door for soldiering among the followers of Jesus um, is, a, is a really significant point that the pacifist has to take into account. Okay. So, I, saw, I mean, these are, you know, I'm not sure, we don't have a trump card that's going to resolve this. Because uh, I, th I think you can, I think you can hold to either one of these in good conscience, but then both have tough questions to deal with. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.